So in the arc of this training, we began by exploring the three trainings, looking at the whole enterprise of how early Buddhism approaches the practice of Dharma. And we explored a little bit around the first training, the training in morality or virtue or ethics. And now we're shifting and we have been shifting as of last week when Emily introduced concentration meditation to the second training in concentration. And really these three trainings serve as a kind of roadmap or template for what we're exploring here in the first turning. This is kind of like the big picture of what the first turning is really uh, about. And in the training in concentration, or what is sometimes also called training in meditation, we have this word uh, that we've inherited called jhana. And I was thinking about how in a lot of ways, we, we run into problems when we inherit words that aren't from our native language sometimes because we start to kind of esotericize these words. We start to think there's something um, not natural about them or supernatural or something that we can't understand possibly because it comes from another culture. And while there definitely is the possibility that there's some things from other cultures we don't understand, I'd say we got to be careful not to assume that we can't understand or that we don't already understand what this term jhana means. I was reading over an article from Lee Brasington, who's an American jhana teacher. He was uh, the first teacher I went on retreat with to explicitly learn the jhanas. Um, in I think it was 2004, in the high mountains of Colorado, did a 10 day retreat with him there. I had very little success on that retreat because I was so tight and I was straining so hard to try to get the jhanas. Later, I had a lot more success a couple of years later when I was working with Kenneth Folk and I had learned some more about how to relax <laughs> at that point. Um, but in that article, Lee, I think it's called Entering the Jhanas, Lee talks about how and remind, reminded me how the term jhana is a literal translation of the term meditation. That's one way of translating jhana. Jhana is meditation jhana or dhyana or in zen or chan these are other asian languages translation of the same term they all mean meditation so the jhanas in that sense is just describing a process of deepening in meditation i want to just keep it very simple here and say when we meditate we deepen into an experience that we are now using this term jhana to describe What's interesting about the early Buddhist tradition is there are 40 different meditation objects or subjects that you can meditate with that are said to lead to or be able to lead to these deepening experience, this deepening concentration. There are objects that are visual called the casinas, which you're looking at a visual object in front of you. It could be like a colored circle or it could be a candle flame two of my favorites. There's the breath, obviously, um, which by the way, is only one of the 40 objects. And in modern mindfulness, it's like such, it plays, the breath is so much importance is given to the breath, but that's not actually how the early tradition looked at things. Uh, they, I think instead we're like, yeah, there's lots of different ways you can enter into jhana. You could use loving kindness phrases to enter into jhana as well. You could even use the contemplation of death to enter into jhana, to deepen your meditation. You can contemplate death or dead bodies. But literally monks would go and sit in the charnel grounds of India and they would meditate on dead bodies as their object. Even that can lead to jhana. Okay, so what that tells me is that we're talking about meditation and it's largely technique independent with this process of deepening. It's not dependent on a specific object of focus. Many things will do. And over the history of Buddhism, many other objects, many other 
subjects of meditation have been introduced that work for people. So in a way it's like, well, what works for you to deepen in concentration? And what is this deepening process that we're talking about? How is it described in the first turning? I think that's important because they do talk about it in a very specific way. And the way they talk about it predates Buddhism. That's important to know historically. This is something that arises out of the Indian yogic tradition. The Buddha learned the jhanas before he experienced what he later described as his breakthrough experience that he didn't get from another teacher, this awakening experience. But he did learn the jhanas from other teachers. He had two teachers that he learned these progressively more subtle states of meditative quiescence or absorption from. He learned how to access them, how to master them. In essence, I remember when I was doing jhana training with Kenneth and he was running me through the jhanas, you know, teaching me how to access them, teaching me how to become facile with them. He taught me the uh, five signs of jhana mastery. This, and this comes again out of the early Buddhist tradition. He said, if you really want to understand these things thoroughly and be able to demonstrate that you can do them, that you know, know what they are and can, can work with them, um, you have to do five things. One, you want to be able to call them up. That's the first sign, sometimes called advert, adverting, A-D-V-E-R-T, adverting to the jhana. You want to call it up, the first jhana. And you want to be able to call up any of the jhanas to bring them up. Then you want to be able to enter them. That's the second sign that you've mastered the jhanas. You can enter all of them. Then you want to be able to abide in them for some period of time. There's a lot of argument now and debate about how long you have to be abiding in these states for them to count. But uh, I'm not going to get too much into that debate right now. Uh, then the fourth thing you want to be able to do is to exit the jhana. You want to be able to exit these states. And you want to then be able to reflect on them. That's the last sign. You want to be able to reflect on what just happened. What was that? So that you know it. Because when you're in some of these states, uh, depending on how deeply in them you are and how long you spend in them, they can be quite formless. They can lack a lot of content. When the body and mind, and here's how I describe concentration. Concentration is the practice of bringing attention to a single point. We bring our, all of our attention, we gather, collect all of our attention in one place. When we do that, at some point, whatever object we're working with of the many that are possible, it becomes foregrounded in our awareness. And the distractions and the other stuff that's happening goes to the background. In the early Buddhist tradition, they have a name for this when this happens. They call it access concentration. I'll share a link to a video um, in which I've described that phenomenon more thoroughly in the training um, space. So you can check it out if you're interested. There's lots written about it. And I imagine that many, if not most, if not even all of you, <laughs> Have experienced this. I actually, I, I, I'm pretty confident that you all have experienced this, um, because it's in some sense it's not so special. It's just like what happens when we lock in to something, like when we're, we're we start to groove with something. Um, it's really hard to function in the modern world without having access concentration, because we have to like if you're reading a book or if you're studying something, if you go to school, you kind of have to have the ability to lock into the subject of meditate of what you're meditating on or you're focused on. So we bring all of our attention to a single point. Eventually we lock in. I want to introduce this physics notion here, this physics formula. It's a basic formula. That we probably all learned at some point. And the formula is pressure equals force divided by area. I was contemplating how this physics principle applies cross dimensions to concentration practice. Pressure, pressure, right? 
equals force, the amount of force that we're bringing to something. Let's, I'm going to use the analogy here of like when you're cutting your bread, you know, in the morning you got your, your bread knife and you're cutting it, you're putting a certain amount of force behind the knife. And then the knife is touching the bread. That's the area, the point at which the, ob the, uh, the object is touching something. And that generates pressure. So here we are, we're focusing our attention on a single point, right? With a certain kind of force of attention. We're collecting and gathering the full force of our attention. And we're applying it usually to a small object at first. It's a, it's a, it's a limited object. This creates pressure and it also brings us closer to what we're meditating on. We begin to become closer to it. It becomes more interesting and compelling. All the distractions go into the background. We start to, we start to be, we start to get really close to it. It becomes vivid, interesting. And at some point, this is maybe what we could call the first jhana. We merge with the object. We become one with it. Where everywhere we pour our attention, it, be, our identity and our attention are linked. We become one with what we focus on. If we focus on anxiety and worry, we become anxious and worried. If we focus on the breath, we become unified with the breath. And when we're unified with the breath, which is a natural process, we just relax. We become steady at ease. And that's nice. And the pressure builds, you know, it builds as we become more focused. So there's more force of attention. And what happens, and this is really important, I think, to understand about concentration and jhana as it develops. And it goes through these progressive stages that there's the so called eight jhana stages is that the object changes the experience of the jhana of the state changes at first it's very blissful physically especially there's a lot of rapture and bliss and there's a sense of sustained attention that we're bringing our attention to this thing and we have to kind of keep that going in order to keep the state like it's like you have to kind of stoke a fire to keep the fire blazing throw in some more fuel and at some point as we become one with the state itself of the, what's called the first jhana and we're one with this blissful, rapturous, very bodily experience of joy. Often few people feel like energy rising in their bodies. They feel excitation, tingling. Um, then we start to notice the stuff about the state that's not quite working. And, and the pressure of it, the intensity of it, causes us to want to shift into a more pleasant and sustainable state. So the jhana begins to open up. The area of our focus opens some. And that reduces and relieves the pressure. And part of what drops away or said to drop away in the first jhana is this extra amount of effort that we're extending to maintain the state it becomes more effortless in the second jhana. So we transition to that state. It feels at that point that the meditation is just happening. It's effortless. And it's still blissful and enjoyable, but it's more smooth. And as this process completes, and I won't go through all the jhanas now, but as the process continues to deepen and develop, this idea of pressure equals force times area continues to morph with, with the jhana, with the object, whatever it is, the object gets bigger, it becomes more inclusive. And what people don't understand, sometimes people assume that it's just like, they're going to lock in on the breath and then they're just going to get into the state. And it's just going to be like, Phew. but actually our attention through this process is expanding. The aperture of attention is getting bigger. We're able to stabilize and steady ourselves on a larger scope of experience on a larger field, a larger area. With the ultimate goal actually of this practice being able to rest on a single point, bringing attention to a single point that includes all points of our experience. That is, you could say the mature expression of jhana or what's sometimes called samadhi. 
one pointed attention on all points of experience. And the, the, the stages of jhana are in a way a kind of movement toward that degree of inclusivity. Uh, the fifth jhana, which is the, marks the beginning of what are called the formless jhanas. The fourth, the fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth jhanas are called formless. Arupa jhanas, lacking form. They um, have English names such as infinite space, infinite consciousness, the sixth. Nothingness is the seventh. Nothingness. And then the eighth, which is my favorite, the title of it, <laughs> Neither perception nor yet non-perception. Think about a very subtle state of consciousness where you're neither, it's neither perceiving nor not perceiving. Because even in nothingness, you could say, there's some sense of a perceiver. There's someone who's aware of infinite space or infinite consciousness or nothingness. So there's still some kind of like something a little bit dualistic about that or off about that neither perception nor non-perception the eighth jhana according to this tradition is as far as you can go with these things uh, uh what is that it's hard to describe so um i just want to say just a little bit about the jhanas and for those of you who've experienced some of or all of them at whatever degree of depth you have you'll understand that these things are really wonderful and beautiful, but are also, once you get familiar with them, they're not that special. It's like learning anything. It becomes normal over time. It becomes normalized. And the early Buddhists, you know, they say this thing, these are really helpful states to, to get into and to achieve in themselves. They're good. They're healing. They're nurturing. They're pleasant. Sometimes it's really nice to just feel very good and relax and the body be at ease. It's like better than a nap, you know? For me, I can't really nap. I'm not a good napper. So it's like John has a nice <laughs> break. Um, and also they're really good because you can use the steady, collected, stable mind and body that come out of jhana to do other things that are useful, especially like insight work or to be a more conscientious person, the other trainings. With a stable, steady mind, it's easier to do both of the other trainings. Um, it's, it's easier actually to do everything. <laughs> so this is another reason it's good to, to deepen our meditation. <laughs> 